If you are a gamer or a PC enthusiast, you typically have a gaming PC similar to this. A large to semi-large case that may or may not display all the goodies that you have worked so hard to get for you to then use to play whatever you want with or for any other non-specific purpose. It is your machine, but it also is a bit big, isn't it? I mean, modern computers have so much empty space in them. Wouldn't it be nicer to make them more small? Well, let's explore that in today's video and see how well we can budget an ITX PC and if it is worth doing in the first place. There are many styles of ITX in the same sense as there are regular full-sized ATX builds, but at the same time there is less choice in what you can get. I can explain. But before that, we have to talk about our case. If you go on any popular website for a PC case, you have so much choice with a fairly large amount of wiggle room for price picking on what you need, even on the used market. So if you want a crazy case, you will get what you pay for, but typically, if you want something that does the job, you won't pay a whole lot either. However, if you are trying to do an ITX build, good luck. There isn't much to choose from on the cheap side of things, and while there's a variety of style in these cases, there isn't a whole lot to choose from either. The trend spills over into other parts of an ITX build too, depending on what you are after. Obviously your motherboard isn't too cheap. Your GPU has to be a specific size, maybe you use a specific bracket or connector if you have a certain case to fit it in, some boards might use SODIMs instead of standard RAM sticks, the list goes on. But the big question is, can we make it affordable? Make a budget-oriented ITX gaming PC without going bankrupt in the process? For certain, nothing's impossible. But let's create a budget for this build. Say, keep the cap at $700. I think that is a fair amount since this will already be a pretty challenging build, all things considered. The first part I searched for was our case. I went on Amazon, eBay, Newegg, and found nothing that was particularly budget-friendly. As a last-ditch effort, I went on to AliExpress, and for $54.19, I found a case and bought a PCI 3.0 riser cable that was bundled with it. It is basic looking, but we are on a budget, and it doesn't look too shabby if I'm being completely honest. Plus, since it is a solid color, white in this case, we could load up the thing with stickers on the front panel and give it a more personal touch if we had some artistic skills to display. And you can never go wrong with an all-aluminum chassis. But anyways, let's talk about the parts, and no boy is there a lot to talk about. Obviously, once again, we are limited to the form factor, so certain parts will be a tad expensive. Or will they be? The very first part I was looking for was the motherboard, as if I can get one used for a decent price without having to shell out too much, I can get an idea of what our other parts might be, and what the budget for that will become. I normally don't do CPU motherboard combos, even though you can save a lot of money searching for stuff like that on eBay, but I found this amazing deal for an i5-6600K with an ASUS motherboard that came with 8 gigs of a DDR Kingston RAM and a 128GB Samsung M.2 as well. For about 160 bucks, this is quite honestly one of the best deals I have seen in a while for motherboard combos. It even includes an Intel CPU cooler, which isn't too bad for the setup considering our CPU TDP isn't too high. We also have onboard Wi-Fi, which makes this less of a goose chase for how we might have gotten Wi-Fi for our system. That just leaves us with looking for a GPU and power supply. But I have a storytelling motif for how that is going to work, so more on that in a little. What matters most right now is the system seems to fit in the case, which is great. It makes it feel plug-and-play-like, since everything was pre-assembled for the most part. The next part is the power supply, which is actually really hard to get as there isn't many choices all things considered. If you were to look up say a 500 watt power supply on Amazon or any other online marketplace for that matter, you would be greeted with a plethora of options to choose from with variations of watts by small margins, big ones, to then fit in any build or budget that you could imagine. But ITX power supplies are rather strict. You can't just say 650 watt ITX PSU and expect to see a lot of choices. You are also limited to your case, which for us is Flex ATX for our power supply. And you can't get around that easily. So for the purpose of what I am about to do here, I'm going to leave the power supply a mystery. But we can imagine it is one of these for the moment. For now, let's move back onto our motherboard. There was only one downside to our purchase, the lack of an I.O. backplate. We could just not have one, which isn't the end of the world here, especially when you are on a budget. 
And while we could take a piece of cardboard and cut it out to fit our backplate, I'm gonna do something that will look a bit nicer, I hope. I bought these DIY IO backplates off eBay for $4 a while back and I've been itching for an excuse to use them. And today is that day. It is relatively simple, really. Use a small blade and maybe some nippers to cut out the holes for our back IO. They even included a guide for any of the ports you might need for your motherboard. But we won't be using that today. Instead, I'm going to just trace and eyeball it as best as I can. This wasn't easy, and I had to go back a lot through the build to make a bigger opening and adjust it where I needed to. And it was as time-consuming as you might imagine. But it does save us a bit of money, since I would take a shot in the dark and guess that it might cost under $10 or more just to find a replacement backplate online. And every penny does count in these sorts of builds. So I don't mind taking an extra 30 minutes to craft my own if it means I save a fair amount considering what we are working with here. Anyways, after getting that taken care of and mounting our motherboard and making sure that everything fits in nice and tight, we can plug our power cables in, which is easier said than done. We are already struggling because of the size, but also because of our excess cables just bunching up in the corners and crevices. We can only cable manage so much for how little space is in this case, so this will have to do. After that, we can go ahead and plug in and screw down our PCIe riser to our case for our GPU. The GPU has to be something that is no longer than 188 millimeters in length, otherwise it won't fit. So something like the $50 RX460 from one of my previous videos would do the trick perfectly. And because it doesn't have a huge power draw, it doesn't need a PCIe power cable to power it either, since it will all pull all of the watts from the motherboard. Which means we could get a relatively low wattage power supply and not have to spend so much for our build all around. And as for storage, we could grab an old 2.5 inch hard drive from a laptop that isn't being used anymore and load it with whatever games we want to play. For a rough estimate of $350, not including the cost of our operating system, of course, this would be a great deal when you think about it. Performance would be like what I have shown previously in my RX 460 video, which you should check out by the way. So nice! But obviously we could always do better since our budget is $700. Instead of, instead of saying what we could have, let's give ourselves a lot more power. With that being said, what was the actual power supply I went with? Well, it was an FSP Flex 500 watt power supply, and uh, it costed 123 bucks. Yeah, I know, pretty expensive, especially for only 500 watts. But why? You could get any generic 500 watt power supply and spend around 40 to 50 dollars for that much. So what gives here? Well, as I mentioned before, there is a limited amount of these guys for a reason. Many reasons, actually. Of course, you will have hundreds of thousands of people buying typical ATX-sized power supplies, and the infrastructure to make them nice as they are have been mastered at this point. When you need something special like a high-wattage modular PSU, you can expect to get what you pay for. But ITX builds are a bit strange, as sometimes they use these same power supplies, or they use a flex power supply, or none at all, and run off a laptop charger, essentially. The case decides what you have to go with most of the time, and makes ITX builds rather undesirable as a result. Only a true enthusiast may be interested in this stuff, right? Maybe. I say we continue with this build though, and see one particular reason I went with this power supply as we move on. One of the few upgrades I want to do though, is our CPU cooler first. While the Intel stock cooler should be able to cool our CPU for the most part with a TDP of 65 watts, the main issue that I feel we may run into with this guy is that it may overheat a bit and throttle the CPU when our boost clock kicks in. So to avoid the stress and secure high clock speeds under load, I went on ahead and bought an ID Cooling IS30 low profile cooler. I paid a little under $25 for it and its TDP rating is 95 watts, which is plenty for when we run the CPU to its limits. The cooler is very slim, at about 12 millimeters in height shorter than the stock Intel cooler, and it should be no surprise to me that it is nice as it is for the price ID cooling has it set at. I also went ahead and upgraded our RAM since, while 8 gigs is fine, again I wanted to make our system a bit more powerful and a lot more useful. Plus our original RAM speeds were clocked at 2400 MHz, and these ones will be clocked at 3200. But now bigger questions start to get asked like if it is worth the money to do these upgrades if you buy motherboard combos. Which is why I'm kind of against motherboard combos in the first place. 
or if it makes sense to spend money on better cooling if you might not even fully use the gains you would get, which is totally fair. But for the purpose of this video, I am just doing this to show that while ITX builds are challenging and can cost a bit here and there, they are still budget friendly if you decide to cut corners or change a part if desired. Plus in my real world case here, I'm going to be reusing any parts from this build and other PCs that I will sell or put in systems for the sake of future videos that I upload. But for now, let's move on to our final parts leading up to our most important one. You could buy Wi-Fi antennas anywhere online and get them for sub $10, maybe $5, and get the performance you would expect. But I like doing things differently, and for this ITX build, it might make our PC look a little bit funky if we put overly long ones on the back. So I was able to go on eBay and find these little guys for $2.16. They are low profile like our system and are just as good as any antenna that we might put on here. And even if they were not perfect, the price is hard to beat. As I mentioned earlier, you could grab an old hard drive from a laptop to throw games on and enjoy the PC without spending too much on it. But obviously there are numerous issues with doing that, so it might make more sense to invest in an SSD. The PC case supports either one 3.5 inch hard drive that would be mounted in the spot our GPU would be, or two SSDs. It didn't mention that the SSDs had to be mounted there though. I assumed that you could put one SSD somewhere else on the back or under the GPU when mounted, and this led to me creatively throw it into a corner with just enough space for the whole thing to fit. So maybe if you have this case, one large M.2 drive may be the way to go. Otherwise, you will have to do something similar to what I did, and what many others have done with this case it seems. You would think this is the most jank part of this build, but spoilers, things are only getting started. Now the GPU is honestly just as difficult to get considering how small it has to be and the connectors you have for it. Forget budgeting at this point. It becomes nearly impossible to find a video card that works with this case. And even when you consider buying new ones, the deals are never budget friendly and fair for what you pay for. Unless the card is advertised as ITX, it becomes ridiculous to search for something that just fits no problem. Thankfully, I have a few tricks up my sleeve to get us what we are looking for. I know we want at least 4GB of VRAM to make this half decent and keep the prices low. I would love to throw an 8GB RTX 3050 or 3060 in, but those are a tad too much to pay for. And while I think the 6500 XT is great, I feel like I can get a better deal from the used market. I wanted to use one of my AliExpress AMD GPUs I bought as they are perfect for this build, but they were too long. So what did I do? I looked at one model variant down from the RX 5500 XT that I have to see if it was a bit smaller, and I found an OEM that just might be under 188mm. After doing some estimates and measurements, I sent a eBay seller an offer which he delightfully accepted. $112.35 for an RX 5500 isn't too bad. And since this is a 5000 series card, you should be able to use FSR for some upscaling if you'd like on some AAA titles. Despite only having 4GB of VRAM, I think that is a pretty good trade-off. Oh, and finally, a quick explanation for the main reason I bought the PSU for this build. I had to buy it last because if I bought the RX 5500, I would need an 8-pin connector to power it. I would already need one to power the CPU, so I would need two of these guys in total. Most of the PSUs I was looking at online only had 6-pin PCIe connectors and not 8, so because of this, I had to spend more than I would have wanted. If I bought something worth more, with absolutely more power than this like one of the Intel series cards, then maybe it would be a better deal money-wise when buying a cheaper, lower wattage PSU. However, this is a mid to large maybe. I want to say getting a GPU is the hardest part for an ITX build, but I also feel like it has to be a power supply too. But enough of my ramblings, let's put in the GPU and put everything in. Uh oh. Well, we have already run into a big problem. The GPU fits, but the bigger issue is how are we supposed to connect our 8-pin to it with this configuration? I did my measurements correctly, I just didn't know where the 8-pin would plug into. The port is literally blocked by the front panel. We can't use this GPU for the build it seems. Or can we? The case is very modular. You can remove all the side panels and pieces holding it together in every spot. This includes the back bracket of our case for the GPU. So we will have to compromise here by removing those parts in the back I.O. bracket of our GPU as well. 
I had to take the whole GPU apart for this, but it gave me an excuse to clean it and give the chip die some fresh thermal paste anyways. But yeah, this means our GPU will be sticking out just a little, but it should be secured still and operate as intended. But this also means there is nothing covering the exhaust anymore, and that could be a problem, especially since I intend to sell this guy to someone. So I'm going to be using my other IO backplate replacement and cut out a cover for him that I can glue on so that I can at least keep it clean and filtered for the most part. After getting that done and adjusting our parts where they needed to go, I can put everything together and start putting on our final touches. The case comes with some rubber feet that you could put on the bottom or any of the side panels if you desired, but I had my own that I liked more so I went ahead and chose them for this build. The other thing you can put on this PC if you would like to is an aluminum handle for the top. Kind of reminds me of the GameCube candle for how small the system is. I decided to not go for it though since I want this PC to have a minimalist feel. And while the handle could fit with it, I think that it looks fine as is. Finally, done. All that is left is to boot this sucker up and play some games on it, but that would be too easy. I went ahead and recorded just plugging it in because I knew something would happen which something did happen. The PC turns on all on its own accord, so something is being shorted or maybe something's loose even, maybe the power supply. I went ahead and opened it up and started unplugging and plugging things in, until I found out the CPU power cable was just a little loose. After I fixed that, we were up and running. Sweet. All that is left is to install Windows and download some games to see how well the system runs. The first game I decided to try was the all reliable Risk of Rain 2. I went on ahead and maxed out the settings and things ran fantastically. With an average of over 100 frames per second, what more could you ask from a PC that you could put in your backpack and go wherever you want with it that isn't a laptop? While the minimum frame rate is 76 frames per second here, I did do a long play and notice it dropped to more like 60 when there was a lot going on all at once, and it only dropped to 30 for a split second I noticed when everything was exploding on the screen. Other than that, very good for what we paid for. Our CPU also held up very well, and I never noticed it going beyond 60-70% to 70 utilization in Task Manager. So far, so good. The next game up is a little bit more slower paced, but it does give us some interesting data on what we have here. Euro Truck Sim 2 is a bit older, but can be surprisingly demanding with everything maxed out, as we have an average of around 86-87 to 87 frames per second. For a relaxed sim like this one, anything more than 30 would have been enough for me. So it's great to see that this title and titles like this one will probably show similar results. The only thing to note here is when driving at night, dynamic lighting did seem to shoot my average down to 10 to 20 frames. That was just what I noticed in my long play that you guys are seeing here. And once again, my CPU was at about the same utilization. And with all the games I tested, I never saw the CPU go above 60 degrees Celsius in any of these tests either. Things seem great for our budget ITX PC. However, let's check a much, much more demanding title like Arma 3. Frame data suggests that maybe our GPU is a bottleneck here. I mean, this is running at max settings, but I didn't even stress it with a ton of activity all at once. The CPU did get pretty high utilization, I think at 80% at one point, but our GPU is the only thing being throttled here. I'm not too surprised though, since this frame data is very similar to my AliExpress GPUs. And I will say what I said there about this guy. Lowering settings to medium should solve the issue and increase frame rates exponentially. But it started making me ask questions though. Like what kind of person wants an ITX PC or an ITX build anyways? Does high frame rates matter to them? What they use it for gaming? Are they a fan of sim games? Indie games? Maybe they like eSport titles. Or maybe they might use it for software development. Or game development. 3D modeling. Or ROM hacking even. Anything really. This PC runs great for its size and price. The total came out to under $640 when I haven't sold any of the extra parts that I have gotten, and if I sold them, I might be able to bring the price down to more like $600-ish. So with the extra 100 bucks you could hypothetically have with the budget, you could buy games or a specific set of peripherals if you need some for on-the-go travel, which, by the way, this thing is tiny. Look at it in comparison to my current rig. You could take this thing anywhere, really. But all ITX builds aren't like that. A large number of them, I noticed, are really fancy, which there isn't anything wrong with that, but I guess it says something about the current state of these sorts of builds. They aren't as user-friendly and seem to be enthusiast-oriented, usually requiring special parts sometimes in order for them to work. At least this is how the market presents itself to the public, I feel. I still think they can be budget-friendly, but you might be better off being patient and getting a used laptop at some point when you find a good deal online. 
or just building your own ATX style PC. In the end though, I am very happy with this guy. He made me struggle at some points, but he also allowed me to use critical thinking to come up with some creative ideas for some challenging problems that were put in my path, which I love. It made this a unique experience, and I hope I have another ITX build in the near future with just as much problem solving as this one. So with that being said, if you enjoyed this video, go ahead and like it. Do subscribe if you want to see more content like this. If you are a true fan, go ahead and join the Discord. There is a link in the description. I will try to be active on there and talk to you guys. I don't normally make videos like this one, so if you like videos like this or prefer the shorter ones, tell me in the comments below. If you have any questions, go ahead and send me those too. And as always, thanks for watching.